All right, so this starts a new semester. If you're unfamiliar with us, uh, we're in Texas, and so we have a STAR test. Uh, it's a junior year for us. Uh, it's a STAR U.S. history test. This covers time period from roughly 1880 to modern times. You know, so this is our first section of Unit 1. It's how I broke my classes into, uh, and it helps, uh, for most part, most people have the same similar ideas. So now while this is U.S. history star material, that's around state, tech, state of Texas test, I refer to constantly. Um, it's a pretty general idea of U.S. history. Um, today, we're going to hit the Gilded Age. Now, I've got these time periods here to break it down for you, these three sections. Um, but they're not definite. Definitely these time periods overlap. History is often thought about from point A to point B, and this happened, and point B to point C, this happened. It's not like that. It's not like that at all. It's, it is mixed, and it's a common problem people have. When it comes to history, but nonetheless, we're going to start with the Gilded Age. Now, this post-Civil War, when we think the Gilded Age, we got to think of what America is turning into, because this is why we split uh, in your typical uh, junior college class, it's History 301, History 302. This is where it splits for a reason. America becomes different. And so this is called the Gilded Age, and if you look at this uh, picture I have here, if you look at it, you have what color is supposed to be, um, it's supposed to be a golden color. Because the idea behind the Gilded Age is that on the outside, everything looks good. It's like gold-plated. On the outside, everything looks good. Uh, it's gold, it's shiny, it's worth a lot of money, things are great. But underneath it, it's not so good. Solid gold, that's good. But gold-plated just means the outside's covered in good, and it's not that great at all. And that's what this time period shows us. Um, this time period is going to show us it's a time when America's uh, booming, Industry is booming, there's jobs, there's innovation, things are cheaper, there's more people coming over to America than ever before. America for a whole seems to be rising as a power in the world. It's wonderful, it's great, our economy is booming. But if we actually get down, look underneath all that, all the data, all the statistics, and look at daily life, it's pretty horrible. Um, things are really bad. For instance, if you take a look on the corner over here of this picture, you see these flames. Um, this is a time period where we have examples of the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, where it's a case where these women were working in a uh, upstairs, uh, upper floor in a building, and the building caught fire, and many people died because there weren't fire escapes, there weren't fire alarms, there weren't smoke alarms, um, there weren't uh, sprinklers, which didn't really exist at this time, but there's no government rules or regulations. There's actually nine stairs. There's one small elevator where a few people could go up and down. Um, so when this building catches fire, there's no safety rules or regulations that the government says you have to have, and these women die. And this is just actually a common part of this time period. This whole time period can be defined as businesses expanding huge, like nationally. Um, but there's no rules for them to follow, no government regulations, and things are pretty bad underneath the Gilded Age. Over here we have a riot taking place, I don't know if you can tell from this corner, um, and these are riots between workers and uh, business owners. This is the time period we talk about unions for a first time, major first time in U.S. history. Down here you've got the railroad, we're talking about Transcontinental Railroad, we've got coal, we've got lots, we've got important people here like Ida B. Wells, as a matter of fact, that change things um, from the Gilded Age to the Progressive Era, when we get to that. Up here I have a star with the name Mark Twain. Uh, I'm surprised to know that me and my students, Simon and Asia, don't read Mark Twain, so I don't know who he is. Uh, but Mark Twain is actually an author of the time period. We have some pretty liberal ideas. He's actually the one, uh, one of two men, who actually coined this term Gilded Age. Um, so it's an interesting thing to note when you look at history, how um, those that do know Mark Twain is right, Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, would be surprised to see that uh, he's actually very involved uh, politically on a few things. Now for this new change in America to take place, um, this is our second industrial revolution. This is huge. This is when things are going to change dramatically. Um, one of the things that helps this second industrial revolution, revolution in America, and this is America, remember, is one man comes up with the Bessemer process. Now he doesn't come up with it, uh, but Andrew Carnegie actually learns about this way of making steel. See, originally steel took a long time. Five tons of steel took an entire day to make. But Andrew Carnegie, a uh, Scottish immigrant, uh, very poor, came over here, worked his way up through railroads. He hears about a process, about this English bullet maker who can heat up iron. And that's where he still comes. It comes from the ground. It's iron, but it's got these all impurities. Iron's pretty weak when you actually get a big piece and jump up and down it. It's pretty weak compared to steel. Uh, you couldn't build a, make a building out of iron. 
um, because it would fall apart. It's not strong enough. But this bullet maker in England has taken small pieces of iron, heated it up to where it looks like molten lava. It looks liquid form, so hot, and he blows air through it, and it burns off the carbon impurities. And then when you pour that melting hot uh, liquid uh, iron out into a shape, uh, beams, if you want to build a building or railroad tracks, whatever you might want, um, once you pour it out and it hardens and it cools down, it hardens, it's incredibly strong. That's steel. Now, that process, that process called the Bessemer process or Bessemer process, depends on who you ask. Um, the Bessemer process, it takes uh, no time compared to the prior process. Um, essentially, five tons of steel one day before this, Andrew Carnegie hears about this, he takes it back to a place called Pittsburgh, creates these huge ovens like this large here. Um, he'll fill it up with hot molten iron, melt it down, burn uh, air through the air through there, burn out the impurities, the carbon impurities, and make steel. And now he can make five tons of steel in 15 minutes. Instantly, you can see the price of steel is going to drop. If steel drops, it's cheaper to buy, it's cheaper to build buildings. You build more buildings, people have more jobs in construction. Now railroads are cheaper to lay because the steel is cheaper. Andrew Carnegie, if you can guess, he's a millionaire now. Well, not millionaires per se right away, but he does destroy all the competition. Because think about it, if he can drop his price of steel, because the more you make, the cheaper it is, right? It's supply and demand. Now price drops around 80%. Everybody's gonna go to Andrew Carnegie, to that man to get their steel. And everybody else goes out of business. Andrew Carney has what we would eventually call monopoly. A monopoly is total control. Now that's just one part of the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age will not take place without the Industrial Revolution. Steel is just one part of that. Um, now we can make skyscrapers. Now you can make lay more railroad tracks than ever before. You can make anything that requires steel. It's not entirely more affordable. So even products are. Imagine uh, trains are now way more cheaper to create or lay track down for. Um, so we've not only lay more tracks down, but it becomes cheaper, so you charge people less money to move them, you charge them less for goods, there's more options, so you can ship out to more areas. It changes everything. Uh, the same process, what Andrew Carnegie builds is a wonderful thing, but we'll talk about him a little bit more later. Now, this revolution also takes place for a few other things. Widespread use of electricity, um, that's gonna create, that means new inventions, new innovations, new ideas, um, which also means more production, um, and means uh, more jobs, and more jobs means more money, again, Sounds like America's doing great. And more factories means bigger cities. This period 1880 to 1920, um, this 40 years, we're gonna see a huge increase in population towards cities. Um, I'll talk about that in a future, actually next unit more so, but if there's more factories, factories don't happen in rural areas like the countryside. No, factories happen in urban areas, cities specifically. So keep that in mind. Um, I do have some random trivia that I think is interesting, but if you want skyscrapers like this, um, there's one I mentioned that had to be created as well, and if you guessed it, it's the elevator. Uh, lots of mentions have come along. By the way, I have other pictures I try to explain as much as possible in my PowerPoints, but if you ever want to build a building out of brick and wood, the highest you could actually go was six stories. Steel meant you could produce a lot more room in one small area. Think of it, so you build it up higher, a lot more office space. You can't have big cities or a large population without steel. Matter of fact, you can't do much without steel. Um, if you ever want to know more about the Bessemer process, you can Google Story of Us, uh, Bessemer process, and you'll see a clip or two about that. Um, America's Story of Us is a wonderful resource for history teachers to put a visual to our stories, um, to our history nonetheless. But uh, yes, it does say it's a place in Pittsburgh, and if you're wondering why the football team in Pittsburgh is called Pittsburgh Steelers, now you know why. Now. Andrew Carnegie is important for the STAR test for a number of reasons. The Bessemer process is important for a number of reasons. Other inventors are important as well. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell created telephone in 1876. Um, he would take this idea of a telegraph, um, so one wire, so one impulse, um, and have hundreds of wires, not hundreds of wires, hundred impulses wrapped in one wire and it creates a complicated telephone. Um, this is 1876. By 1900, it's widespread, much more spread. His company is called American Telephone and Telegraph Company, also known today as AT&T. But the big guy we talk about when it comes to electricity is Thomas Edison. Star, our state test really focuses on not the fact that he created a light bulb, like right? that's pretty much common knowledge. But what is important, what's most important, is that lights meant that factories could work. 
to the open at nighttime. Imagine now factories can work at nighttime, which means you're producing twice as much, the price can go down. You have second shift at nighttime, which means you can hire more people, twice the number of people. Um, that is a huge deal. Not to knock Edison, but it does do quite a few things. Electric motors, power stations, does quite a bit of, of stuff. But for our state test, that's a big focus on Edison, what he does with lights. Now this is a personal idea. Edison, to me, he's a horrible person. Um, if you read about him a little bit, his arrival with Tesla, Nikola Tesla, the scientist, um, is interesting and shows Edison's true color. But in the state of Texas, one thing we focus on um, is the teaks. And those standards say that you know Edison, and Tesla is not in the teaks at all. And that may change one day, but Edison has a reputation that you should check out yourself if you get a chance to, um, nonetheless. Other inventions do come, come up from this time period. Uh, we had electric solar machine, passenger elevator, typewriter, um, electrolyte we talked about, telephone we talked about. The turn of the century, we have the airplane. Uh, you can see why the second industrial revolution innovation just takes off with the opportunities that we have. Um, just a couple of guys that you do need to know is Edison uh, with this uh, uh, electric bulb, electric light bulb. And not so much that he made it, but what it meant. And that meant you could work all hours of the night. So Transcontinental Road is completed shortly after the Civil War, if you look at his dates, by the way, Civil War ends in 65 and 69. Transcontinental Road goes right through the northern part of the United States. Well, it wasn't supposed to, but that's a whole other story. Um, that's pre-Civil War. But nonetheless, it's built and it's completed. Um, most of the work done by the Central Pacific on this side, California is actually done by Chinese immigrants who are going to do the brunt of the heavy, dangerous, explosions, hard, hard work. On this side, we see a lot of Irish and freed slaves, ex-slaves, as it's after the Civil War, do a lot of work for Union Pacific. And here they meet and unite them in a ceremony with a golden, uh, 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 driving golden stake into the uh, railroads as a symbol. Um, it's not there anymore, don't try to go get the gold. Uh, but what's interesting when you look at this photo is that you see no, you see no uh, Chinese or uh, ex-slaves in this photo at all. These are other people involved in the railroad, not the actual workers who built it. They were probably still working and building other parts of it. But nonetheless, the Chinese kind of railroad opened up things, changed things quite a bit. First, you got transportation, which you're going to see in some tests really focus on that. They will point to some states in the West and say, what helped this population grow so much? Obviously, Transcontinental Railroad, because now people can get there at a faster pace, more safer, uh, quickly um, as well. So we see population rise in this area. That's common sense. It's a communication networks too, not just people to people, but a lot of people forget that if you actually look at many telephone, these first railroad uh, laid down, there's telegraph wires that run to it. So you, and it makes sense. If you're trying to connect the country with telegraph wires or city to city, of course, you go along the railroad and you post these, put these posts up, connect all these wires, um, and you have telegraph wire along the railroad tracks. It makes sense. Eventually, those become telephone. Um, you can't have communication networks without just kind of railroad connecting it. Um, it's not just people. It's actually like communication through telegraph and telephone, too. But the thing that's really important to understand is that this creates a national market. Now, that's just like it sounds like. If I'm selling goods here in Chicago, or Omaha, or Chicago, I mean Chicago, um, if you see I'm connected to a whole bunch of railroads, once we have Transcontinental Railroad, my company in Chicago isn't just selling to local people in Chicago, I'm selling to the whole nation. I've created, I now have a national market. The railroads create a national market for business to sell to the whole country. And the examples I'm gonna use is a company called Sears. Oh, it used to be called Sears and Roebuck. Uh, if they're based in Chicago, um, they could have a catalog and they would put in every single train. And so ladies could get on that train, they hop on the train, they have a catalog in their seat, they open it up, it's a Sears and Roebuck catalog. It's a pretty dress, I like, I like that dress. You can write down the name of the dress, the order number, whatever information you need, put money in an envelope, and mail the envelope to Chicago. And you know, you take your train to San Francisco, you do this, you mail it to Chicago, in just a few weeks, you could have that same dress that's famous in Chicago, that's being bought and sold in New York, you could have it here, in San Francisco. Now, a dress is just one of many examples of uh, products, but it does open up the game for a lot of companies. When you think about major companies that we know now, like Sears, Goodyear, uh, I can't think of anyone's off my head, they're companies that started in this time period, like AT&T, they started in this time period, and they've just expanded since then. This is an important part of US history. It's, everything's different now. So with that national markets, it makes sense. 
If I said international market, I would mean that it's globally, right? My market's globally. That doesn't take place yet. But actually on our next unit, we talk about America's desire to have an international market and go to other countries to sell. This time it's just national market. So make sure you understand that concept. Um, and, 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 to, it's important for population. You're gonna see questions about population, uh, migrate, people migrating, even communications. But the national market is probably one of the hardest for students uh, around the age of uh, my students to understand, but national market just means now, wherever you're at, the road allows you to sell to the whole nation, which is good for business, and good for you, right? Um, I do have some stats here with population growth if you wanna look at that. I do have this phrase, free enterprise system. Now that phrase, I honestly should change that. At the high school level, they don't really use the word free enterprise system. Um, we see the word free market or capitalism. Essentially for the purpose of this class, it's the same thing. Uh, for the purpose of history, uh, introduction to history class, it's the same thing. So like I always tell my students, hey, and next thing you know, it's don't write free enterprise, write free market, write capitalism. Um, and that's the kind of business uh, econ economic idea we have in America up to this point in time, is that the government should stay out. We call it laissez-faire, you may have heard that, hands off. The government should stay out of the marketplace and let it be, let it run its course, it will adjust itself. This is a time period where it's, it's strong. People feel familiar that with the Guild Age. Um, what we will see as these businesses grow, like the first national business uh, across the country, it's the railroad, to make sense. As they grow, we realize they need to be checked, put in a check. Um, society will decide that, Americans will decide that, and we'll expect the government to put rules into place to make sure these companies are playing by the same, rule, same rules. Um, but at first, it's a free enterprise, free market, capitalist. That's the idea behind America as far as they go with that. That term laissez-faire to reinforce you, if you see that anywhere on a test or notes or anything, laissez-faire was a, coin, a term coined years before this. Um, it was supposed to be one of the reasons why America is going to be so great, because the government stayed out of the economy. Um, I always tell my students above this, right, hands off. And you always remember, government, hands off. Stay out of the economy, let it do whatever it's going to do. Don't interfere. But that does change. This is why we start talking, this is why this period things shift so dramatically in US history. We have two acts to take place. First, the Interstate Commerce Act. Now this is targeted toward the railroads. Don't be freaked out by words. Commerce is another word for business. Think commercial, so selling you something. Commerce, commercial, business. Interstate, state to state. What this law was passed, this act of 1887, Congress decided that they have the right to regulate interstate business. Now it says that in the Constitution. We're not word from word, but briefly to it. Uh, and so they pass this act, and it's really targeted towards the railroads. Um, they're charging some farmers some prices to ship out uh, uh, their crops, uh, other farmers other prices. Um, there's even some stuff going on with uh, a guy named Rockefeller, which we're talking about a little bit, how he's using the railroads to squash other people's competition and stuff like that. And pretty much a lot of unfair things the railroads were doing. And the farmers had enough of this, and they reached out to politicians, and they bugged them, and, and they pushed for this. They lobbied, essentially, to get this into place. Now, I always tell my students, there's two things to help you on tests. If you know this was done to control railroads, know that. So I put R&R &R for railroad. I always tell my students, circle that. But also make sure you understand this point. This is the first time in U.S. history where Congress has stepped in to regulate business. Regulate means to control, to make rules. Regulate business. First time. It was the Interstate Commerce Act. So if you see anything that says like Interstate Commerce Commission, that's just a commission in charge of enforcing the act. Don't get freaked out by those words. That's not the only first, that's the first time we see Congress regulate business, but it's not the last. Just a few years later, you're gonna see the Sherman Antitrust Act is put into place. And a trust is just simply a word. I always tell my students about trust, write the word monopoly. Because it's an anti-monopoly act, really. It's designed to break apart monopolies that have gone too strong, control too much business. Now, students always ask, why do you want to control business? That, that seems unfair. The government should stay out of it. Quit trying to tell everybody what to do. Well, monopolies actually hurt us. As we defined monopoly earlier, is when one uh, company has complete control of a service or a product. So with my students, I use the example of a television. When I grew up, our TVs were tube TVs, which means they're like this wide, but also like this deep. Like they went pretty deep, pretty far back there. Um, the big screen TV was like this big, uh, this tall, but also like this wide. It was a joke, right? Now, if I was the only person that made TVs, and I made two TVs, I would never make better TVs. Why would I? I can make whatever is easier for me to make. You guys have to buy it from me. You can't buy TVs from anybody else. No other company exists. 
I control the TV, TV industry. I have a monopoly on TVs. You guys suffer. I can charge whatever I want because I'm the only one providing the service, right? So I can charge you a lot. I can have bad product. It could explode on you. Like, check out the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Right? Products could be horrible, but you had to buy from me. If I have a monopoly, nobody else had, could have control over the TV industry. So you had to buy from me. What we noticed, though, is that if you have what we call competition, okay? Say, I've got TVs, but then this other person uh, creates TVs, and we use the name of John. John creates TVs. Um, he makes a better TV than me. He creates a flat screen TV. Well, now I've got to do something. That guy, my competition, makes a better product. I've got to make a better product. So I match his and I make a flat screen TV, but I realize, hey, he's making a flat TV screen TV. He calls it plasma TV. I'm going to make an LED TV. Much better than plasma. That, 20 years ago in college, I picked plasma. Horrible, horrible mistake. Um, LED TVs worn out, better screen, better picture and everything, right? So now I make LED TVs and he's like, oh man, I'm gonna make LED TVs as well, but I'm gonna make, instead of it being like a 720, I'm gonna get 1080. So he makes a 1080. I make a new TV that's 2K. He makes a 4K TV, all right? So you see where we're going here, like we're making the product better. Because we're competing and want people to buy from us, we have to make a better product so consumers win, okay? Um, we can take this to OLED, um, uh, organic LED TVs if you want to. You got Cur TVs. There's been some companies that try 3D to see if that works. That happened a little bit a while, a few years ago. Um, so the innovation's there. When competition's there, innovation's, and people get better products. So competition is better for the consumer. Also, it's better for the consumer for another reason, and that's just the price. I can't charge too much for a TV if my consumers uh, can just go somewhere else and get the same TV, same type of TV at a cheaper price, right? Um, so the price goes down as well. So competition uh, creates innovation. Uh, it creates uh, better prices. The consumers benefit. And Congress realizes that. So they created the Sherman Antitrust Act to keep any monopoly from getting too big, too strong. And this plays a role today. Just the other day recently, um, I think it was JetBlue was trying to merge with Spirit Airlines. Um, to make one company and they asked to buy it out, but they had to get approval from the uh, uh, from the uh, commission that allows mergers and the federal government said, no, you guys can't merge because it'd be unfair. Um, the uh, prices would go up, you can charge too much. Monopolies now it is really dependent on who appoints these people in charge. So it's gotten pretty political here in the year 2024 now, but we see this quite a bit when it comes to uh, monopolies. Sometimes the government says, no, you can't merge. If these two companies merge, it becomes a monopoly. You have too much control, too much influence, and consumers suffer. So that's why we have monopoly. We have the antitrust, or oh, I just call them anti-monopoly acts, but it's students who know of trust, it's a monopoly. Here's an example. You've got, this was the Senate. Clearly, these are senators and Senate seats. Um, but these guys behind them, the Steel Beam Trust, Copper Trust, Oil Trust, Iron Trust, Sugar Trust, Tin Trust, Coal Trust. These are all big trusts, um, monopolies, if you will. Um, and you see by looking at this, I always ask my students, who has the power here? If you look glancing at this, you can see who has the power. It's not the centers, it's the monopolies that influence the centers. You can just tell from the size of these men. And so this character, uh, this cartoon is named Puck, um, P-U-C-K, Puck, not a bad word. Um, but if you ever see like his cartoons copied, sometimes the P looks a little messed up, but it's still Puck, P-U-C-K. Um, another cartoon I hear is not by any of my famous material, so, but the idea is there, right? You have the highway of competition, but it's blocked because of monopoly. The Sherman Antitrust uh, Act will break that up. The Federal Trade Commission, if you will, will crush that rock um, and allow the highway of competition to continue. Um, so monopolies, Sherman Antitrust, anti-monopoly, That'll help you with any test you take. I do have this here, because everybody was asked about the Monopoly game. The Monopoly game wasn't created until 1930s during the Great Depression. Um, so, and that was to remind people how great things used to be um, and so forth. But uh, that's a whole other story from the Great Depression, nonetheless. Now, uh, with these poor working conditions in the Guild Age, we can see long hours, low pay, Kids got paid a third of what adults got paid because it's a hor horrible, take it or leave it basis. You get fired at any time. Um, if one student, if, one, if I'm a factory owner and I control these people and I say, hey, 
Josh, um, uh, you said you want to see me. And Josh comes to me and says, hey, I want a lunch break. I demand a lunch break. You're fired. Get out. I can replace with somebody else off the street. Um, immigrants are coming over by the thousands in New York at the time and New Northeast uh, United States. So all the major cities up that way with major factories, we can, can replace anybody in a heartbeat. Um, but that's a take it or leave it basis. You take it or get out. I'll replace you. That's the way life was. Not that great. One fifth of 215 worked. I've seen that statistic actually say one fourth. This is actually from one textbook from a couple of years ago I used in my classes. But one fourth or one fifth, whatever statistic is, you can can't argue that's a lot of children working not in schools and so you can just see from these pictures a focus on the industrial revolution um, and child labor in the industrial revolution because there's no government rules or regulations saying kids can't do this or it's not safe or anything like that uh, not for a little bit at least and now if you're thinking hey brown it's around this, this this is world history and you're right because great britain does this first we just copy it so well in america um, so technically this is actually like the victorian age over here we do have the um, uh, child labor over here we have it in America. I'm always asking my students like why are children perfect workers and this common question is always told by history teachers like the hands are so small you can get them in anywhere. And I don't know if that's true. Uh, it makes sense. It's logical for me but I do believe it has a lot to do with how easy it is to manipulate and treat children. This kid comes up to me wants a bathroom break get back to work. A grown man does it. Yeah, I can't do much about it right. It's a grown man. So I always argue that it's more than just a little hands. It's you can tell them what to do. You can boss them around. You can pay them less. Children are the best workers, but that's how bad things are during the Gilded Age. There's no laws protecting children, no child labor laws. There's no laws saying they have to be in school to get an education. Um, and just like now, we have this big issue here in Texas, at least. Um, it's almost like people pretend they don't know it, but students often get jobs while in high school to help pay for rent because they struggle so bad. Um, but it's, it's very similar to that 120 years ago. Uh, now this does change. Child labor does get put to an end, and you're thinking, oh, it must be some really good people, some good, solid, progressive Christian people that want to change things. And I always tell my students, unfortunately, history is dictated by money. It always is, and I can argue about anything. In this case, it's nearly different. The people that hate child labor so much were other workers, because they're constantly getting replaced by children. So if I'm a politician, and all my constituents, the people that voted for me, or workers or laborers in factories, I gotta appease them by creating child labor laws to protect their jobs. Because children were taking their jobs. Now, there's a whole uh, story behind that. But nonetheless, uh, so to please the plant workers or workers in general, factory workers, I'm gonna make sure I pass child labor laws to make sure kids stay out of the factories and they can't get jobs. Um, and then the people vote for me for doing that because I protected their jobs. Not because I think it's the wrong thing. It is a wrong thing, but again, money runs the world. Now, other things you can do. I gave an example earlier that take your leave of basis that, hey, if this kid, Joshua, comes in and I'm like, boom, you're fired, get out, so pick somebody else up and bring him in, there are other options. Joshua could, theoretically, get together with his fellow workers. He could unite with them. And when he unites with them, he can all come to agreement. And I always use my class example. Oh, it's all workforce for me. Josh will lead you guys, you're united together. And you come to me and you say, hey, we want a lunch break. We want eight hour work days. We want safer conditions and work in the factory. Whatever your demands might be. I could say, get out, you're all fired and replace you. I could still do that. There's enough people who do that. But how much money would I lose from training all these new people? And then if you guys agree that you, you make these demands, you say, hey, if he doesn't meet these demands, we go on strike. You stand outside the door, you carry these sticks, these picket fence sticks, that's what I call it, uh, picket mines, uh, with posters on them, and you march around, and you make sure if I try to hire new people, they gotta come through you. And if that happened back then, it was usually violent. If, these, if I hired what I call strike breakers to come in and come through this uh, picket fence and come to work and replace you, you're not gonna let them through. It's going to get pretty bad. It's going to get bad out there as it did during that time period. Um, so I can't even hire any people because you're going to stop it. Even if I do get them in there, it's going to cost me a lot of money to train them. I'm going to lose money. So that's why you guys unite because together you have more influence. And you go on strike or you could do a slowdown where you work half as speed. And so my profit is half as much. And I might not realize it right away, but it's hurting my bottom line, right? Um, you can do other things as well. You can purposely mess up machines. You can do lots of, lots of things as a union. 
because that's what you did. You united and now caught a union. I always remind my students, we call them unions, but sometimes on a test, they like to use the word organized labor. They're labor unions. They're workers united, right? Labor union, workers united. Organized labor is just those people organized together as an organization, whatever helps you remember it, um, keep that in mind. The two that we talk about, uh, the Knights of Labor, one of the first ones that we see in America, um, they hope to create a single nation, a uh, national union, Every all workers in one union to have influence. Doesn't do too well. I actually had heard about how this is almost kind of a secret to be uh, a member in the Knights of Labor. Because if you think about it, if I'm Andrew Carnegie and I'm hiring people for my steel, my steel plants, and if you're a union member, I don't want to hire you because then you could spread the union message. You can it'd be, it'd be more difficult for me as a as a steel plant operator or owner to deal with unions. They're gonna slow down on my work. So I'm not gonna hire you. So I've always read that Knights Labor was like you had a secret card and everything. You didn't always brag about it because it wasn't a good thing if you're trying to get a job. That didn't do too well just fall apart. The American Federation of Labor, AFL, that comes on with a different idea. There's craftsmen, there's like there's plant work, or sorry, steel plant workers are one union. We've got railroad workers, another union. Carpenters are another union. Tansmith are another union. Blacksmiths are one union. They're all different unions. Now they can help each other out um, because there's always stories about hey, the steel plant workers went on strike um, and they communicate with the railroad union and they're going to follow that as well. They're going to support them to go on strike as well to help uh, build unity in that. But AFL now exists today as AFL CIO. So they do exist, some idea. As far as our state test goes, you gotta understand that these are organized labor, sometimes called unions, sometimes labor unions, sometimes called organized labor. And the whole idea was to push for workers' rights and workers' conditions to get better. If you can remember that, and that Samuel Gompers is a founder of AFL, you're doing just fine at our state test. That's just funny how that works out. So the only thing they ask about Samuel Gompers is that he's a founder of the AFL or that he works with workers' uh, rights or unions, just understand if what unions are, and you'll be okay uh, nonetheless. I do have some things that I think is interesting. The workers fought for the eight hour workday, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what you want. That comes into play now. Eight hour workday, higher wages, that makes sense. Safety codes and factories, equal pay for women, still working on that 120 years later. Opposed child labor, because children were stealing their jobs. And the last one, they supported, labor unions supported strong restrictions on immigration, because what the immigrants always get accused of? Taking jobs. There's a wonderful South Park episode about this if you get a chance to look at it. It's pretty funny. Now, I do have a link on here for the Pullman strike of 1884. And strikes in general during this time period, the Pullman strike is no different. There, there's a common theme for these strikes. You don't have to know one in particular, but it helps to know and understand what they are. Now, since you strike, a Pullman strike, there was a uh, man named Pullman, and he created these luxurious town cars. Get a chance to Google it right now if you can on the side window. But if you Google Pullman uh, town car, you'll see these uh, train cars that are just beautifully done on side. It looks like royalty. It looks like thrones. It's not a normal train car at all. But he made these high-end cars and, and did well with his business. Um, as a matter of fact, he did so well. He created his factory. He created his own town around it, about 50 miles south of Chicago. Um, he created his own little town um, where he bought houses and built them, or he bought land built houses. And his workers lived in those houses and he charged them rent. Those workers went to a general store and they bought stuff on their future paychecks. Um, like literally, it was a genius idea for Pullman. The problem with Pullman is that he decides he's gonna cut wages. Um, at one point he cuts wages, he cuts hours. But does he cut rent? No, he doesn't. Um, he actually demands the same rent. Um, food prices don't change. And so people at Pullman will walk out. They do a full on walk out and they go on strike. Now, I don't want to go into details about this too much because there's a big political debate about who's the good guy, who's the bad guys. And today, it's the same thing. Some people say unions are lazy, people just don't want to work. Union members are trying to fight for their workers' rights. Like, they want the pay that they were promised or they want the pay that they had before that they were taking away. There's massive political debate I just don't even want to deal with right now. But nonetheless, the Pullman strike does eventually end and ends violently. The Pinkerton Detective Agency is called in. Some people defend them. Um, workers will shoot at the Pinkerton Agency. They take some prisoner um, and make them surrender. They're trying to burn boats. Like it's a whole ordeal if you look this up. It's pretty interesting how it goes down. But the Pullman strike was just another clear example. Things turn violent with strikes during some period, almost always. Second thing you're gonna know is that the government would typically side essentially always with the business. 
As a matter of fact, the Pullman strike, the president at the time was a Democrat, and Democrats supported unions back then, just like they do now. They supported unions. In order to make workers happy, they actually created a holiday in September called Labor Day. And it was supposed to be a time where you're off and you get to relax. Um, and he does this, uh, Cleveland, I believe it was, does this to appease the workers. He creates a national holiday. Congress passes this, he signs it, boom, we have Labor Day. But for strike workers, that doesn't fix the financial money problem. Like, it's, it's a great gesture, but it doesn't fix it. Um, as a matter of fact, what ends up happening, the way the strike ends, um, Pullman himself will uh, uh, actually uh, ask the state government to help. Uh, the, the governor at the time is, uh, he's a, a Democrat and he's pro union so he says, no, I'm not gonna help you. Uh, Cleveland eventually will send troops. Um, and when you're thinking, what's the legality of this? How dare you send troops? Um, the argument is that by stopping the trains being made and stopping the trains on the tracks, the workers, the union, was stopping mail from being delivered, and that's a federal offense, and you can't have that. So the United States will send in federal troops, and they will shoot at the um, uh, workers. Uh, many people, many people do die from this. Uh, but just the the, fray, the, fray, the the theme here, uh, and a phrase I need you to understand is. Strikes turn violent, and the government almost always will side with the business. They believe in business property rights well over workers' rights. Workers' rights not, not, not doesn't exist. Property rights for the business owners to do. Um, the Pinkerton Detective Agency was actually the uh, Homestead strike that I'll talk about in a second. But nonetheless, it's the strikes all always end violently in some form or fashion. Uh, but nonetheless, I kind of got ahead of myself. But when I talk about the Homestead uh, strike, uh, Andrew Carnegie is the guy of the steel plant. Um, Andrew Carnegie, like we said, is known for the steamer process, create steel. But what kind of guy was he? Was he good or bad? Uh, he paid low wages, trash. Worked long hours, very few breaks. If somebody tried to form a union, he had that person fired, his friends around him fired, even relatives fired. Made very clear and very certain that unions weren't going to exist in his factory. Now, Andrew Carnegie was also a genius. Um, he had some ideas, too. Um, in many of his factories, he quit managing them himself and had somebody manage for him. Uh, at the Homestead factory, he had a guy named Frick manage for him. Uh, it was really good because it takes the blame away from Andrew Carnegie when things go bad. Um, but uh, before we talk about how bad things were with, the, uh, with Andrew Carnegie, let's talk about the good. Andrew Carnegie is known for his philanthropy, which is another word for charity. Gives a lot of money away, right? Three hundred fifty million to build libraries and endow universities to help create universities and help supply what they need. Um, and you're thinking, well, why do you pay low if you just give all that money away, regardless? And this was part of Andrew Carnegie's belief system. Um, he actually wrote a whole paper about this. Um, he does it. He believes in charity. The man who dies rich dies disgrace. He spent his whole life trying to give away his money that he had. Um, he gives it to public good, right? libraries, museums, universities. And why doesn't he just pay his man? Well, he had this thing called the gospel of wealth. He wrote this uh, essay in a reflection when people were always arguing, you know, pay your people more, how horrible conditions, why do you do this but give money away? And he made it clear that as a wealthy person, um, he's lucky, um, and he believed it was every wealthy person's job to give back. He said you should give back, but you just can't give people money, you know? Um, if I give you money, I help you today, but tomorrow you're going to come back and you need more money. But if I create a system, something where you can get better education, and you help yourself out of that situation, and you're better for the rest of your life. So that's why he picked libraries. That's why universities were so important. It's kind of this phrase, um, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach a man a fish, you feed him for life. It's the best way you can describe the gospel of wealth and your carnage of belief. And other guys share this belief with them. Now, sounds like a great idea. He wants to help education, wants people to get smart, he's helped him. He did have a bad side. The Homestead strike is another example of another strike. Um, that's, that's the one where the Pinkerton agencies called in and they're shooting and have exchange with their workers as well. This is a very political, ta hot topic debate. Andrew Carney's not there. He decides to go on vacation back to Scotland before this. Um, Frick is a guy in charge. Frick holds no mercy. He hires the Pinkerton agent, detective agency and supplies and guns to go take back the plant from these uh, workers and there's fire exchanging shooting back and forth. Nonetheless, the same idea, violence and it's bad. The government, uh, local government there would say, um, 
will get their workers to stop. Uh, the workers pretty much had the pinky to the HC pinned down, and the workers decide, hey, we'll give these guys up. We'll let you take these guys out of here if you charge them with murder because they killed some workers who were on strike. And, um, and the local government says, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. We'll put them on trial. Um, the minute uh, the uh, labor union releases the workers, um, actually release the Pinkerton Station agency, the man, um, and they actually release him back to the local authorities. The local authorities don't tra charge him with anything and let them get out of here. But it just shows you again, they don't side with workers. Government officials don't side with workers. The police don't side with workers. Nobody really sides with workers. And the strikes always end violently. One guy that did share Andrew Carnegie's ideas, um, not necessarily that, hey, it should be violence. Because Andrew Carnegie was a genius that he put himself out of here. He took himself out of this position. Frick was the manager in charge. Frick takes the blame. Frick, everything is bad on Frick, not Carnegie. Carnegie is smart like that. And his whole gospel of wealth that he has, that he really pushes for. But he's not the only one that believes at the time. There's guys like Vanderbilt. If you ever heard of Vanderbilt University, man was wealthy with trains. Uh, Vanderbilt is going to contribute to Vanderbilt University. Carnegie, also Carnegie Hall. It's, if you Google it real quick, it's a massive, huge, beautiful place. Um, if you have a concert there, that's where you want to play. That's the top. You know you made it if you played Carnegie Hall, essentially. Um, another man that shared this besides Vanderbilt is J.P. Morgan. You guys heard of him. Another man, Rockefeller. The Sherman Antitrust Act really was targeted toward him more than anybody else, actually. Rockefeller controlled oil. And now he did this in some pretty ruthless ways. Um, story goes that he was started off at one point low life, uh, pretty poor. He was trying to refine oil. And here where I teach at in Baytown, that's just what they do. The, the, the plants here refine oil. And you can turn oil into different chemicals like tar for the streets, diesel, gasoline, kerosene, that's what they did back then, um, jet plane fuel, lots of stuff. Um, when you take the oil from the ground, it's refined into different things depending on your focus. Um, of course, him at the time is kerosene. But what he's doing, is got one business partner, and there's hundreds of these companies doing this. They're refining the oil for kerosene. And at one point, uh, Rockefeller was pretty torn down. Um, he just had a newborn baby, he's in a shack. His business partner comes to him and says, I'm done, I'm out, we can't compete. And Rockefeller convinced him, let's try a little bit longer, give him a little bit longer, let's keep trying this. And I got an idea, okay? And Rockefeller comes up with this idea, he goes, the problem with oil, with the oil industry today is when people refine kerosene, I can buy a jug of kerosene from company A, and next month I buy another jug of kerosene from company A, and it's trash. One month is good, next month is bad. Like, meaning that it burns great, it doesn't burn at all, or burns too fast, it's unsafe, whatever it might be. Like, kerosene is not refined consistently. Rockefeller has this idea. He goes, hey, we have standards, and that's what we're going to tell people. All our oil, all our kerosene, all our refined oil has a standard we must meet. And we're gonna call ourselves a standard oil company. And now if you're a consumer, this makes sense. I'd rather buy, pay a little bit more, pay from Rockefeller knowing it's gonna work, than buy some kerosene from this other guy. I have no clue if it's gonna work. If it doesn't work, I gotta buy more anyways. So even if it's a little bit cheaper, it could cost me more in the long run. I sort of buy from Rockefeller and his business takes off. Now that's not bad, that's a good business model, that's a good idea, it's innovative. What's bad is how he spread and controlled the oil. Um, he would go to companies and buy them out, sometimes they would agree, but sometimes they didn't. So if one person, uh, say uh, Janet, Janet owns an uh, oil refining company, and I'm Rockefeller, I come to buy her out, and she says, no, I'm gonna make it, I'm determined, this is my dream. I can't get her to sell to me, but what I can do is go to the railroad, and I say, hey railroad, you ship out her oil? Yeah. You ship out my oil, right? You make a lot of money off me because I ship out a lot of oil. Not too much from her, right? Railroad, if you keep using her to ship out your, to help her ship out oil, I'm no longer gonna use you. I'll go to a different railroad company. The railroad has no choice. They stop shipping out uh, Janet's uh, oil. Um, and Janet goes broke. And then Rockefeller comes right back in the picture. Hey Janet. You want to sell it to me now? Well, of course she has to. She's company went down or went under. It's not worth anything. And so Rockefeller would spread and buy more and more and more oil or refinery plants until at one point in time, he controlled 90% of the U.S. oil. Now keep in mind, oil was not discovered in other areas until after World War II, 1950s. 
at this point in history, up until World War II, America's the number one oil providing country in the world. And this one man controls 90% of it. That is by definition a monopoly. So when they created Sherman Antitrust Act, it was made to break up Rockefeller's oil company. Now, I did watch something the other day, uh, John Green Crash Course, US History Crash Course. Um, he points out that all these companies that Rockefeller's oil got broken into, uh, eventually they merged, 100 years later, they all merged back together into bigger companies. Um, that's something to look at. Uh, but nonetheless, from cartoons for our state of Texas uh, state test, you can see this is actually a cartoon one year. This is an octopus grabbing up all parts of DC from politicians to the White House to the Capitol building. And this octopus is called Standard Oil, meaning they have grasp and controlling everything. That's how strong monopolies were. That's how people felt about that. Another reason why they passed the Sherman Antitrust Act to get rid of that monopoly. Also, the way he was using railroads, the Interstate Commerce Act should, could fix that as well to make sure railroads didn't do that to any kings of business. Mm -hmm. Now, it sounds like an evil man. It sounds like he do whatever it takes. Uh, maybe he's a good, good businessman. Nonetheless, he still shared the same beliefs as Andrew Carnegie, and he gave millions to build the University of Chicago. The Rockefeller Foundation still exists to this day that donate, that use it, uh, spread his money out and donate his money. His quote, charity is useful only if it helps you to gain independence. If I give you money, you're dependent on me. But if I build a university, you go to a university and acquire some skill or become educated, you're now independent, you don't need me. So I will give charity to make you independent, but not to make you need me anymore. So these guys, these guys at this time, these guys who built these industries were called captains of industry created jobs, built these industries, changed the world. Or were they Robert Barons? Because they treat people so horribly. You know, every year I always get some different ideas. And many students now, we know Texas is a very uh, conservative, right-sided viewpoint. But many people are just like, hey, they're great. They're great businessmen, they're smart, they're geniuses. Uh, it's worth what it's worth. And some years I get some students that are just like, no, that's just gaslighting. Like, they're just trying to make up for that, but in the end, all they want is money. It's, it's a good debate to have. Um, it's a good UBQ. Teachers or instructors, if you're following this, you can actually Google uh, Andrew Carnegie DBQ. It's one of my favorite ones. We debate if he's a good guy or a bad guy. Um, Andrew Carnegie on uh, Rockefeller, there's two of our prime examples we use. I used to teach about Vanderbilt and J.P. Morgan, but they don't ask them on a state test anymore. Now, what I'd like to include to help you understand this more is some entrepreneurs during this time period. And I have a couple of definitions up here, entrepreneur and philanthropy, just because these are common words some students might, might not know, depending on the, uh, the year. But entrepreneur is somebody who takes a risk. Um, Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, these are entrepreneurs, they take the risk, they reap the benefits from it, it's difficult. Now when they give money, it's philanthropy. When they give goods, services, whatever it might be, I always tell students, think philanthropy, think charity. If you know, you know what charity is, philanthropy is just think charity. And these three guys are entrepreneurs from our time period. Now this is outdated a little bit. Um, this guy, some students know him, he's Bill Gates. And this guy, more students know who he is. It's Zuckerberg from Facebook or Meta, whatever you guys want to call it in the future now. Um, and then we have uh, Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple. When I use these guys as examples, they're entrepreneurs, right? And they created ideas and jobs. Um, Bill Gates is part of a pact uh, billionaires who agree that by the time they die, they'll give away half their fortune, and when they die, they'll leave the other half for charitable goods. There's a few uh, billionaires like this out there. Um, Zuckerberg, I remember giving, when Ebola virus broke out in Africa, he donated a million dollars right away to help stop the spread of it. Um, so these guys do give charity. Now, mm -hmm. some people give charity because it means tax breaks, um, and so they only give an X certain amount. So be careful when you hear about that. Now, as far as entrepreneurs compared to, I don't know, um, Andrew Carnegie, who created lots of jobs, technology doesn't create that many jobs. When he, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, bought Instagram for a billion dollars, only 13 people went to Instagram. A billion dollar company had 13 employees. This is what's different about entrepreneurs now and then 120 years ago. Those guys, 120 years ago, created jobs. These guys aren't creating jobs. They're innovative, they're smart men, they're creating all kinds of great stuff, but not creating jobs, which begs a question I've always asked. Should we be giving tax breaks to Mark Zuckerberg, who barely pays anything in taxes? Because um, he has a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar company. Um, what we, I think we should look at jobs. Like if you create X amount of jobs, then you get an X amount of tax breaks. And it has to be American-made jobs, not in other countries. But 
again if I was president, right? Now there are a couple other guys I could add to this list now. I always ask students, who would you add to the list? Give you time to think about it. And I guarantee you, one person you were thinking is Elon Musk. He's an entrepreneur, like him or hate him, he's a hard worker. Um, Jeff Bezos, entrepreneur as well. And those guys, you already create more jobs. Jeff Bezos created a lot of jobs. He costs other people jobs, like his company shut down other companies, but he created a lot of jobs and pay as well. He gives a lot of money to charity. He's a philanthropist. Um, when we look at the numbers though, we can kind of, eh, not that great. Um, he'll give like one or 2% of his whole income to charity, which is good, don't get me wrong, but when you look at the numbers, like it's one or 2%. You know, actors like Leonardo DiCaprio gives half his money to charities um, and it still doesn't equal to his 1%. But if I gave half my money, that's a lot more than you giving 1%. But nonetheless, uh, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, there's probably somebody else I'm forgetting now. Um, and I could add to this and change this nonetheless. But these are entrepreneurs of our times. And are they captains of industry or rubber barons? Um, it's hard to say, because they do pay better. They do have more government regulations and rules. They tax thing though the tax things frustrating knowing teachers like me pay a tax but guys like that don't we got my last part of the guild age to figure out to finish off here it's called the haymarket affair haymarket square affair haymarket town square it could be any number of those things but this is another strike that goes wrong again now this is at haymarket uh this is another plant that's on strike um, guys are on strike, strike breakers break come up, somebody is killed in this altercation, and they disband the strike workers. Again, bring it, bring it up, bring it up. The union leaders call for a meeting at Town Square, at Haymarket Town Square. And union leaders are actually trying to keep the peace. Um, they call for this meeting and they meet up at Town Square that night. Um, there are a lot of publications that are pushing like revenge, uh, demands, all this other stuff. But when the labor union leaders get up there, they say, hey, we got to keep the peace. We need to stay together, stay strong, um, stay united. Um, this is a setback. Uh, we lost somebody. It's all peaceful. Even supposedly the mayor was okay with it because the mayor looked at this and said, hey, they're just talking. I have no problem with this. I'm good. But the chief of police did not. Like, how dare these guys do this? Uh, remember, a lot of people look at workers' unions as lazy. Um, even nowadays, people make that argument. Um, where well, the police will surround the uh, square, um, the police chief will enter uh, in the middle of it and tell the labor union worker, the labor union leader to get down, get out. You guys aren't welcome here. Um, and then it becomes an exchange, like freedom of speech, we're protesting, we're assembling, we can do this, back and forth. Nonetheless, a bomb is thrown into the crowd um, and that bomb goes off. Yes, 120 years ago, people had bombs. Um, and once a bomb goes off, the police opened fire. Some of these guys in the crowd have guns too. I mean, it is America. If you're not from America, it's welcome to America. Uh, and there's, there's an exchange of fire. And in the end, after this bomb goes off and the shooting does, what happens? Seven cops die and four workers die. Eight people are arrested. Four are executed. And out of those four executed, only one is actually even a member of a union. So that's pretty interesting when you look at the numbers here. Now, what you say is, like, all right, let's round again. For the third time, I've proven that strikes end violently back then. Okay? The government will execute people. They blame the workers for this. So the government, again, will side with business over workers. That's the two things all these strikes proved. Violence is the way it ends. Two, businesses always supported by government. Government does not support their workers' rights. What this also does it changed the perception for a lot of people. See, labor unions were growing quite a bit, uh, like between, well, Industrial Revolution from 1880, they're growing really rapidly, but all this stuff with all these strikes and all this violence, it starts looking bad for workers. When we look at um, the Pullman strike, uh, we'd argue, where are the workers on a strike? We don't know who restarted that. They shot them, maybe, you know, that's, the workers aren't too bad. Um, when we go to, um, by the time we get to Haymarket Affair, it just seems more common that the workers are out of control. It's almost like they're anarchists. I mean, they'll be called anarchists. People don't believe in government or law and order at all. Uh, they'll be called socialists. They want the government to control everything. Um, at this point in time, remember Marxism has been out there. Communism has, uh, communism doesn't exist yet, but the Marxism is out there. Um, eventually we'll call all union workers socialists. 
They want the government to control it. Um, they're communists now. Oh, they're all communists. Um, they want the government to control businesses and all this other stuff. In the end, you can even make this argument today. If policemen die in any altercation, especially seven of them, you're not going to find the majority of people supporting the cause. People are going to look at labor unions in a negative light. By 1910, only 5% of workers were union members. And up to that, it was growing rapidly. Um, but it really drops after all these repeated, every time we have these strikes that end so bad, especially the one that puts cops, uh, that kill, the cops die. That's, um, that just looks horrible for the labor unions itself. Um, I guess you can argue it's a public relations thing, but regardless of this, um, it really hurts the uh, popularity of the unions. Now, they, I did read something in the while back that said um, they've gone back and they to re-image what happened, and it would appear that the cops, the police, when they surrounded and opened fire, they may have done more damage to each other than we realize. Many of these police may have died from friendly fire. It makes sense if you surround a crowd and shoot into it. Yeah, that might have happened. So hard to figure out now, but this becomes infamous for that, that, um, that instance where now people, public's not gonna like unions that much. Even to this very day, we can make that same argument. Now this is called the Gilded Age. All this bad stuff about how it's really going down, this industrial complex of industries controlling government with lot and all lobbying is coming to a role. We don't talk about that yet too much, but the working and wealth conditions, things are changing. Before the Industrial Revolution, if I was a carpenter and you worked for me, we worked side by side. I trained you, you became good, you broke off on your own, did your own thing. That's the way it was. But we have these factories. You have guys that work the factories in usually overalls, blue overalls or coveralls, if you will, um, coveralls, and they have blue collars. And they work down on a factory floor, but the guy who manages it is wearing a suit white tee, white button up, white collar. Um, and he's not with them. He's not working with them. He's making more money with them. Even the clothing is different. Like you walk in, I wear this, you wear that. You've heard a phrase, blue collar meaning worker, white collar meaning arrogant boss. <laughs> um, you've heard that phrase before and there's becomes tension now. Before the industrial revolution, that tension didn't exist. You work side by side. Now, you guys are on the factory floor. I'm a white collar. I'm better than you. That tension between workers and wealthy people got really strong during the Gilded Age, and eventually businesses get out of hand, uh, companies get out of hand, businesses get out of hand, landlords get out of hand, and the government is expected to do something. And the government does do something when people make those votes. So that's how we're going to end the Gilded Age with Rockefeller um, in control of Congress um, and the boss, the true bosses of the Senate here. This ends the Gilded Age. We got two more when we talk about Unit 1.